Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, so it's about 10 o'clock. We'll get started soon. Um, hope everyone's well. Hope you're staying safe. Uh, we're now in, we've now got 11 people with us. So we've got quite a few, usually get about 16. So maybe a few more will join. Um, anyway, welcome to week five. And this week we're looking at uh, using methods, classes and objects. A big week this week, a very important week. This is really core, core material to what we do in this course and the follow-on course. We're building on this week especially. Okay, so. And we're entering a brave new world of objects. So this week's, uh, so last week we looked at looping. And in the tube, we also covered some extra things as well that we haven't really covered thoroughly or we hadn't covered yet. Oh, I'll do a sound check first. Can everyone hear me okay? Is there any problems? I can hear you. We can hear you. Oh, good. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jared. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Sanjin. Okay, good, good. Um, okay, all good. Everyone's saying yes, so that's good. Um, so we, we covered methods in the tube, even though we hadn't covered them yet in, in class. And we did um, some methods in one of our two questions. We looked at the printf method and string format methods to format data. So format integers, format strings, format floats, two decimal places, thousand separators, specifying column widths, left and right justify, all that sort of stuff. And um, so that was all part of our tute as well. Uh, I think we did a bit in last week's lecture as well, but we did a lot in, a lot in the tute as well. Okay, so that was last week. Uh, we, did, we, we did quite a lot. And uh, this week, oops, <laughs> sorry. Okay, I've got next week down below. I'll, I'll remove that next week. So this week we're using methods, classes, and objects. Uh, next week is a midterm break. So there's no classes next week, no classes. So I recommend if you can, I know it's hard when things are very difficult at the moment, but if you can use this time to catch up if you're behind, that would be really good. If you can use it even to get a little bit ahead with the coursework, then you can give yourself a head start for the second half of the term. Okay, just makes your second half of your term that little bit easier. If you, if you get, you get ahead a little bit, even a little bit of a week, it makes it so much easier. Gives you a running start. Okay, and keep in mind that what we do is building on prior weeks. Okay, building on prior weeks. So you have to know and be comfortable with everything we've covered so far. So when we're doing objects, you need to know about methods and and, and things we've done before and if statements and switch statements when we're going ahead and doing arrays you have to know about objects and methods and arrays uh, and uh, if statements and switch statements okay so it's all building the knowledge we, do, we get is building you can't forget what you've already known you've got to keep applying it and applying it and applying it every in future weeks okay so there's a lot to keep in your head that's why i said right back in the start of term it's like learning to play a piano okay you've got to get practice 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 and I reckon, like, like I said, back in week, week week one, if you keep a little summary file with all snippets of code that you found useful, that will save you a lot of time as well later. Save you a lot of time searching. Where did I do that? I know I've done that before. Where did I do it? Keep a little summary file. Okay, because by the end of term, that summary file is going to be quite big. <laughs> I'm going to cover a lot. So week six builds on week five, and we're going to do more objects, concepts and more object uh, extensions okay uh, quick question in the chat window uh, the main the main just was um, did, did I did I just set the, the constant for the value n for my assignment or do I, do I have to write code that loops through my student number and determines the highest number which is a good question but no you just just create a constant uh, so if you highest if you highest student ID If that was just student ID, the highest digit would be an eight. And so I just create a constant called N and set it equal to eight. Okay, so just, just do it nice and simply. Uh, for summer two, <laughs> if this sort of thing was required for summer two, which it isn't, then we could do a loop and pull out the characters and, and pull out the digits. But uh, yeah, not for summer one. I think there's enough in there already. Okay, so as, as we're going, if people, if people type into the chat window, I'll either paste it in here or into the programs that we're working on so that people can see what the chat is. I won't put people's names, so, okay. So just so people can see on the video what it, what it, what it all means. Okay. 
So week five, using methods, classes, and objects, we'll, we'll make a start. So we'll learn about method calls and placements. Uh, we'll identify the parts of a method. We'll add parameters to methods so that we can pass in information to the methods, which is what we did in the shoots. We'll create methods that return values, which is what we got ahead with and did uh, uh, in, in week, week four shoot as well. Uh, another question there in the chat window, I'll just paste it across. If you have a high number, you can set n to something lower. Yes, of course. Yes, you can set your n to something lower while you're coding and testing. Yes, that's right. So if my n was eight, while I'm testing, I might set it to equal to one or two, just to get that testing going, and uh, and, and or maybe three. You know, so set it to small values. You don't want to be typing in eight or nine things every time. Okay, so set it to a low value, and then before you do your submission, make sure you've set it back to the high value. So quite right. We'll add parameters to methods, we'll create methods that return values. Two of that, both of those things we did in week four was cheap. We jumped ahead a little bit and we did it for one of the questions, the, the barcode question. Okay, we'll learn about classes and objects. We'll create a class and we'll create an instance methods in the class. So this is all core, core material. Not only for Java, not only for object-oriented programming, but for just about any programming language you do, this is all core, core material. Creating objects and, and working with objects. We'll declare objects and use their methods to work with objects. We'll create constructors and we'll appreciate classes as a data type. So up until now, we've sort of been using data types like string and int and double and boolean and char and other ones like that. So we've been using those sorts of data types. And we saw that string was a reference type and that all these other ones were primitive types. They're built into Java automatically. And we've also done a little bit of date. And in one of the two questions, we did some local date. Okay, so these are all these are all reference types, all these ones here. These are all what's called primitive types. Okay, and we learned that in a, a, a previous class that uh, when you declare an integer or a double or a boolean or a char or any of those primitive types. The, 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 the variable name refers to the actual value of the data. Okay, so the value of the data is held there by the compiler or by the Java runtime. Okay, when you declare strings and dates and local dates in any of these reference types, when you when you say string name equals Mike, okay, name name contains a memory address of where the data is called of where, of where the data is stored. Okay, so if I want to print out Mike to the screen. Java's got to, or print out name to the screen, Java's got to jump to the location in memory where name is pointing at or referring to and get the data that's contained there. So it's got to do like a double hop to get to the data. With ints and doubles and booleans and chars and all those primitive types, the data is right there straight away. So it doesn't have to do the double hop. Okay. So, and, and we'll be creating our own reference types this week. So we're going to be creating our own data types. And they're called user-defined data types. We'll be creating our own user-defined data types, which will means we'll be creating our own classes, which will contain objects. Okay. To contain objects to work with objects. Okay. That's what it's all about. It's a very important week. We're going to cover a little bit of ground, but followed up with week six's material as well. So a method is a, is a it's just a named block of code. Basically a method is a named block of code. It consists of a program module, some round brackets, some curly braces, and one or more statements inside those curly braces. And it's it's a, it's a, it's a block of code that carries out a, a pre- a, a, a preset card or a set a well-defined task. Okay, so it's a block of code that carries out a well-defined task. Okay, uh, executing a method is the same as invoking it or calling it. And you, you, for us at this stage, we're calling or invoking it from another method. For example, our main method might call other methods that we've created. Um, all of our all of our Java programs at this stage must have a main method because 
Um, that's what Java looks for when it's running your program. It looks for the public static void main string square brackets args method. Okay, and then we can call other methods from our main method. So you've got, we've got um, a calling method, and that's the method that's being invoked via a method call. And then we've got the called method is, is uh, sorry, the calling method. Yeah, the calling method. So if we've got main, and that's calling method one and method two, then method one and method two are the methods being invoked or called. So they are the called methods, okay? And the main method here is the method doing the invoking or the calling, so it's the calling method. Okay, so that's calling. These are the called or invoked methods. Okay, so the called method, the called methods are these ones. They're the ones that are being invoked, and the calling method is our in, in, in our in our program. So now it's going to be the main method, but later on we'll be writing code like this. And method two might call method one might call method thirty four. Okay, in which case this method is now a called method and a calling method. Okay, because it's calling method thirty four. Okay, so we'll end up with a whole a whole hierarchy of methods calling each other. Uh, by, 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 later, by later in the term, anyway, we will. Okay. So here's an example of our a main method, invoking or calling another method. So display address. Okay. And so display address, we, we can tell we're calling a method because there's round, round brackets there. Okay. And so we've got a, 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 something that looks like a variable name in Java with round brackets after it. That's that's a dead giveaway of a method being called. Okay, so we're invoking a method called display address with round brackets after it. Okay, and there's nothing inside the round brackets. So there's got to be a display address method which has nothing inside the round brackets, otherwise Java can't call it. Okay, if the only display address method had something inside the brackets, Java would say, I'm trying to call one without, without anything and I can't find one. Okay, so you, you, not only does the name have to match exactly the same case, it's got to have empty round brackets after it in the method being called. And if we had a, if we had that method, uh, the the um, the the definition for that method, we would have something like this maybe, and we'd have an access modifier, a return type. I'll put these all as one word so you can see that they're just single things and then the name method name round brackets are mandatory and then in here you have optional op, op, optional parameters or arguments okay and then curly brackets okay so that's sort of the, ge the general form for a method you've got an access modifier a return type a method name and any optional parameters you want to pass inside round brackets there that are declared up here inside the round brackets. That's sort of the general form. So our display address just had, we, we, we can fill in part of that with our display address method so far. We know it's, we know it's got to look like this. We know the method name's got to be display address. There's got to, there's got to be nothing inside round brackets. We still need to work out what these parts are. So the main method executes automatically by Java when Java runs your programs and other methods are called as needed at this stage only by the main method or other methods that we create that are called by the main method. So the main method is the entry point to our programs and it's going to kick things off and determine what methods are called and if those methods call other methods, fine, they can call other methods, that's all fine, but the main method starts things. So you can, you can place, so, that, so there's a load of your classes. We've got, for now, we've got public class, by class name. So act, public is the access modifier. Class is just a reserve word to indicate that it's a class, followed by a class name, it has to be the right case. Um, class name, class name, it's gonna be uppercase C. So inside here, we've got the main method, public static void main 
string square bracket args. And we've already had a good look in the shoots that if you change any part of this, like you make that private or you leave off the static or you put an int there or you don't put square brackets or you don't put a string, we found out that you can leave off any part of that and your code might still compile fine, but Java will not run your main method. It's got to be, it's got to be exactly those fingerprints. Okay, otherwise Java won't run your main method. Okay, but you can also put methods here. You can put, you can actually put data here and you can put methods here. And you can also put data below your main and methods below your main and you can put more data and more methods. Okay, so you can have all this sort of layout here going on where you, all, all your data and methods are all mixed up together, um, but they're all self-contained blocks of code or whatever. And, um, but you have data here and data here and data here if you want to. And then you can have methods before your main, methods after your main, methods down here after some more data. Okay, so you can have that sort of structure if you want. That's what I, that's what I would call a chaotic st structure. And my, 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 the way I lay out all my code is that I have the methods, the data first, and then the methods. Okay, so have your data, any, any, method, any data you need to declare, put that near the, near the top of your, your class, then any methods you create, you add, you add in there, and then have the main method right down the bottom. Okay, that's a nice structure to follow. In some textbooks, they actually put the main first, and then usually the data and any other methods. That's fine. It doesn't really matter which of those ways you go. Java doesn't Java doesn't care, but just be consistent. Okay, but I, I, I like this way at the main right down the bottom. So the first thing I, I do when I open a Java class, is I scroll right down to the bottom, see what the main's doing, and then I can take it from there to work out what's going on. Okay, we've now got fourteen students. That's good. Fourteen. Uh, so any, any questions so far on, on methods? Any questions? You can chat with this, with this microphone or use the chat window, whatever you like. Okay, no, all good. So a method must include a method header. It's also called the method declaration and a method body between curly braces. And that contains one or more statements that carry out the work. You can actually have a method with no statements in it as well. And uh, so up here, we go back to our display address method or our, our, our general form of a method. So you can, have an, you can have nothing inside the round brackets if you want to. And wh whatever is inside the round brackets, that is called the implementation. So if someone says to you, write the implement implementation for a method, it means write the code for a method, F fill in the body of the method, what needs to go there. So the implementation is a body that makes up the body of the method, of a method. Mm -hmm. Okay. Implementation. So for a display address, uh, it's it's not being passed any data, so there's nothing inside the the round brackets there. Okay, and it's it's got system.out.println followed by the company name, system.out.println followed by the company address or the first line of the company address, and then system.out.println followed by the the city and the state and the postcode. So it's an American book, so it's got American examples. Okay. So you can see we've got, a, we've got a public static void main. That was our main method, followed by a public static void display address. Okay, now they've declared it as public there. My, my suggestion to you, we, we'll talk more about private and public as we go, but uh, so keep all your methods private, unless there's good reason for them to be public. And um, so the main method's got to be public, otherwise Java can't run our code. But all the methods we create at this stage, keep them private, just so we're getting ready to, for when we're developing code in industry and you want to keep your methods private so nothing outside the class can invoke them unless you want them to. 
Uh, so if you want your methods to be invocable outside of the class, then you can make them public. Okay. So unless they need to be invocable um, outside the class. And uh, we'll, talk about, we'll talk about data as well, but it's also keep your data private unless there is very good reason. We'll talk a bit more about these rules as we go, but these, these are the two rules I want you to keep in mind. So keep your methods private unless, is, unless they need to be invocable from outside of the class, okay? And keep your data private unless there's very, very good reason to make it public or something else. Okay, we'll talk about that, 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 that a lot more as we go as well. So, so these are what I call the golden rules. <laughs> so just keep those in mind. Okay. So here, they, here public, they've used public, that's fine for our early, early examples. If somebody calls display address from outside of the class, it's not gonna do any damage. All it's gonna do is display the address. So, uh, you know, there's no harm caused. Okay, so um, so the method's not returning anything. There's not there's nothing there's nothing needs to be returned back to the calling method. So that's why it's a void method. Void means return nothing. So there's no return statement down the bottom here. And so it's a void method. It's a static because our main static, and we haven't learned about instance yet. So we're just dealing everything with static, and it's public. And like we said, we could have made that private if we didn't want anything outside the class invoking it. But in this case, it's such a simple method, there's no harm done if someone does call it from outside the class. Okay, so we've got two methods, and we've got two method bodies. That's a body from, for the main method, and this is a body for the display address method. Okay, any questions so far on anything? Anyone confused or worried? Okay, I oh, know this is all brand new for a lot of you. Okay, Wayne's saying thumbs up, thanks Wayne. <laughs> okay, I think everyone's okay, cool. So the method header contains the optional access modifiers or specifiers, a return type. If there's no, if there's no return required from the method, it's void. It's got to have that return type there, either void or something. An identifier, which has got to be a valid Java name followed by parentheses, which might contain data sent to the method. Um, and we'll talk about, talk about that more shortly. And you place, for now, we place the entire method within the class that uses it. And we don't place methods within methods. So you can't do this sort of thing. System.out.println. Okay. So you, you, you cannot do this. You can't put it in your main. Okay, so methods inside methods aren't allowed in Java. In some languages, you can do that. Uh, Pascal and C++ and C, you can do that, but not Java. Okay. Um, or at least not for what we're doing at this stage anyway. There are tricks around this, of course. But um, for, for now, all your methods have got to be separate self-contained units. So place the entire method within the class that will use it, not within any other method. The, the, the access modifiers or, or these, these chaps here, you can have public, private, protected, or package, okay? Now for what we do in our class courses in Java, everything will either be public or private for our access modifiers. We don't, uh, don't want really to talk about protect, private and protect, or, uh, protected and package very much because uh, we'd need another Java course really to look into those uh, enough. Okay, so we just use public and private. They're also called access modifiers and methods commonly use public access unless, like I say, uh, especially when we get later on in, in developing classes, we might have most of the methods inside a class being public, but there might be a few that we don't want called outside of the class and they'll be private methods. Okay, so we'll keep our methods private, unless there's good reason for them, for them to be public and callable outside the class. And maybe most of our methods will be public, but there will be a few there that we don't want to, 
to, to make public. We want to be private, okay? especially by the end of term. And, and your data, keep your data private. And we'll talk about, talk about that more as we go as well. Um, so the main method, uh, it's, it's got to be public static void main string square brackets args, otherwise Java can't invoke it or, or find it when it's running your program. The static methods means that it do not require an object to be created and we haven't got there yet. We're not really up to talk about objects yet, but um, just means the class can run it without having to create any objects based on the class. And here we've got display address method is not required to specify public access. However, if access is public, the method can be used outside of the class. So we've specified public in the example on the slide. So the display address method could be called outside the class. So if I had another class, public class, Mike's class, uh, public static void main, actually I might put it in just to not confuse people. I won't use too many acronyms. Okay, so this is another class and our display address method was public in the other class. So I could call that here. So we need the class name, which is called first, that's our class name first dot display address okay. and that would run the display address method in the first class we just created so because that method is public this code is okay it's okay because the method is public so it's class name followed by a dot followed by the method name followed by any followed by round brackets, followed by any bits of data that need to be passed through to the method. There's none in this case, so it's just round brackets, empty, empty round brackets. Okay, but we could invoke that method from outside the class if we wanted to. Okay, don't worry, this is, this is jumping a little bit ahead, so don't worry if this confuses you. Um, most commonly public access, yep for what we're doing so far. We've done that slide. So the return type describes the type of data the method sends back to the calling method, if any. Okay, so if there's no return data, uh, the, method, the method return type is void. Void means return nothing. So for display address, it was a public static void, make it, uh, void method, and that means there's no return statement. If we had a return statement, and our, and our method was declared as void, Java would give us an error saying, a void method cannot return data. Or if we had a, or if we had a, a method that was say an int method and we didn't have a return statement, and that's an error as well. So we declared a method to have a, have a type of int, and if there's no return statement in the method, then that's an error as well. Java would pick up on that and say that's an error. I call them address one and address two, just give them a different names because it's all in one example, but it's just extending on the one example. Okay. So the main method in an application must have void. It's got to be public static void main string square brackets followed by something that could be called Fred. It's just a variable name. We can call it whatever we like, but it's got to have those fingerprints, public static void main string square brackets. The display address method does not send any information back to the caller that calls it. There's nothing returned back. So the return type's void. And later, later on we'll create methods that return values. Okay, any, any questions so far on anything? Anything worrying you or not sure? Okay, chat window's quiet. That's good. Thumbs up again, thanks Wayne. Uh, so the method name can be any legal Java identifier. It must be one word, a single word, no spaces in it, just like our other Java rules that we've covered so far. Uh, no embedded spaces 
and it cannot be a Java keyword. So just like all the word, all the variable names we've done so far. So it starts with a lowercase letter and then every word must be uppercase. Um, no underscores between words. I used to write code like that and it was really hard to break the habit. So no underscores between words. Um, and, uh, and you can't start with, you can't start with digits. Okay, just like, just like with variable names, we saw those, um, those identifier rules which we spoke about back in week one, week two. The same thing applies here. Okay. So class names start with an uppercase first letter, then uppercase every word. Method names start with a lowercase first letter, then uppercase every word. And data names or variable names start with a lowercase first letter and uppercase every word. It's only a small point really, but it's good if we all follow the same naming convention, because then if I need to write code that invokes, that makes use of your classes and calls your class methods, I know that the naming convention I think is right off the top of my head is correct. I know it's one you've used. I don't need to think, oh, uh, you know, James uses this naming convention, so I've got to put underscores between words and, and uh, Beth, Beth uses these naming conventions and I've got to think of this way when I call her code, that would be a bit of a nightmare. <laughs> ah, okay, so Sanjin's written a comment here, chat. So a method might be what people refer to as a function in C or C++, and that's exactly right. A methods, functions, procedures, they're called procedures in Pascal, they're all the same. In, in C, I don't want to get into the wrinkles, but there are, there are some slight differences you can have as well. Um, we don't really want to get into the wrinkles, but just think of it that way now. It's, it's, all, all a function is is a named block of code, and that's all a method is as well. Okay. The difference is in C and C++, your, your functions don't have to be part of um, data classes um, or you know, part of a class, really. So. But anyway, that's getting outside the scope. Um, so you must have you must have public static void main, but this this display address could be any valid Java identifier. Okay. Every method header must contain a set of round brackets or parentheses. They may contain nothing at all or they may contain one or more bits of data that need to be sent. A fully, fully qualified identifier is a complete name that includes the class. Okay, so when we talked about calling this method in the first class, I put the class name dot there. Okay, so I've told Java, this method lives in the first class. Okay. If I didn't put that in, if I just put display address, that would be an error because Java can't find this method. It only looks in the current class. Okay, so first dot tells Java where to look. So that's called a fully qualified identifier or, or method call. Okay. So other methods you write might accept data within the parentheses. Our display address method doesn't. There's nothing inside round, the round brackets there. So it's just the simplest possible method we can have really. We're not passing any data to it and it doesn't pass anything back. So it's return type is void. Um, arguments is data you can use in your call to a method. And so parameters are data items received by the calling method. So we've got, we got the, we're now gonna pass some data to our methods. And we did this back in the tute as well. Just, we, we sort of jumped ahead a bit in that tute question for bar, for bar charts. Um, so we're now gonna look at that in, in, uh, in, in formally in class. And um, so there's two, two terms there. So if display address method, let's, let's grab that again.
Okay, sorry about that. Uh, PC crash. Had a blue screen of death. Haven't seen one for so long. Um, is Zoom playing up? Just said. So we've got our 15 people back, so I think everything's okay. I think everyone's reconnected, or I've reconnected to everybody. So thank goodness. I'll just do a quick sound check before I continue. Can people hear me okay? Yeah, we can yes. hear you. Okay, can, thanks, yeah. Barry. Okay, yep, yep. Okay, thanks, Troy. Thanks, Glenn. Whew. Okay, so. Just see where I got back to. Okay, so arguments and parameters. That's what I was going to talk about. Okay, so if I'm, if I'm invoking a method called method one and I'm passing in a data mic, okay, let's just back up, have a look back over here. So arguments of the data items that you use in a call to a method and parameters of the data items received by the call method. So, okay, so that's an argument. And then if, we, if we're invoking method one, we should have a heading um, that could be public or private. And it could be what we're doing at this stage, it'll be static. And we, do you think it's going to be void or what can we tell about the method name so far or about the method? Can anyone have, have a, oh, we haven't really done enough. So I won't, I won't, I won't uh, try it yet, but it's going to be a void method probably. It's going to be called method one and it's going to take a single string parameter, string name. Okay, and then curly brackets. And then it's going to do its work in here. Whatever, whatever it's going to do, it's that's going to be the body of the loop the implementation. Implementation. I'll get there eventually. Okay, so we, we we can see from this method that it's probably going to be public for what we're doing at this stage. All the methods are static at this stage. It's, it's not. We don't we don't know if it's receiving anything back, so we'll just assume it's void for now. It's going to be called method one. And it's going to take a single string string parameter. Okay, so so parameters of the data are just being received by the methods, and the arguments of the data that are passed to the method. So Mike is an argument. Name is a parameter. Okay, so we've got a question there from Wayne, a good question. And we are sort of jumping ahead a little bit, but if a method had a return type, you'd have to use an equals as part of the calling statement. And Mike, maybe, <laughs> it's optional. And we'll talk about that more as we go. Just because a method returns something doesn't mean you have to receive it and doesn't mean you have to act on it. Okay, so we'll talk about that more as we go as well. As well. Um, so if, if, if we had another method where we had um, data being passed and we're passing an integer as well, so Mike and 33, a bit like our bar chart example we, looked, we talked about in week four's shoot, then it's passing a string followed by an int. So the method, we'd have to, for that code to compile and work, we did a main, a method one method, which took in a string followed by an int. These are the arguments and these are the parameters. So an argument is the data items you use in a method, a call to a method, so that's those, the data items you use. And it could be variables or field names or just values. Okay, so I'm just, here I'm just using hard-coded values. But uh, if, Here I'm passing name to name and score to score. They don't need to be the same. It doesn't even matter if they are the same and the score. Okay, so that works fine as well. But that's got to be a string and that's got to be an integer. Okay. A string and an integer. If you get them the other way around, if you pass the integer first, 
Java will look through your whole program and try and find a method that takes a, a method called method one that takes an int and then a string. And if it can't find one, it will give you an error. Um, cannot find a suitable method sort of error. Okay. So that would, for, what, for the code we've written so far, that would be an error. Okay, so the order is important. Same data type and same order. Implementation hiding. Okay, so encapsulation. We did talk about encapsulation earlier. Encapsulation. When we're speaking about why learn Java, and one of the big features of the language is encapsulation. In fact, it is for all object oriented languages, encapsulation. Can anyone remember what encapsulation meant? It's going back quite a few weeks. Just looking at the chat window. Not really, okay, Sanjay's saying not really. I've got another question there as well. Can you explain parameters again? Okay, so another chat. Can you explain parameters again? And um, right, so, uh, so, so th these are parameters. They're like variables declared inside a method header inside the round brackets, where you can pass data through to the method so the method can do its job. Okay, so with the display address method we looked at earlier, the address was hard coded. It was it was inside the system out print line statements. So no no data need to be passed to the method for it to do its job. Okay, but here, because I'm passing in a name and an integer, I can use those here. So if um, if score is less than zero, system print line name scored plus name scored less than zero. Else, name scored zero or more. Okay, so you can see I'm I'm using the bits of data that we've passed in, or that I assume are going to be passed in, and I can use score because that's just like a local variable inside this method. Method one's got a local variable called score, and that score is the score value is actually passed into the method when it's called. For example, string mike comma thirty three. Okay, so Mike, Mike goes to name. So here, when I do a print line, the word Mike would appear. And when I, when I use score for this method call, the value 33 was passed in. So um, 33 is not less than zero. So I'd say name scored zero, Mike scored zero or more. is what I'd see on screen. Okay, so parameters and arguments, we're just passing data to a method so that it can do its work. Okay. Rather than just having hard coded data like that address was in that prior example, not really useful. Uh, we want to be able to do things more, um, more generically so it can be used for other things. Uh, another question there from Troy. I'll put that into the chat window. If we're using a math function, it would be done using a method, right? That's exactly right. So. And we had a look at some chat functions in the shoots. Uh, we, we had a look. So if I want to get the absolute value of a number, um, int value or val equals math dot abs minus 44. We had a quick look at the math, math class in the, in the shoots. And we saw that the absolute value function was one of the functions in there. There's sine, cos, tan, maximums, minimums, all sorts of things in there. There's a whole lot of useful stuff. And um, math.abs, you can pass in a negative value and it returns a positive value. So that return plus 44. So the, the absolute value. Okay, so, so if we looked inside the math class, if we looked in Java's code, we would find an abs, a method that was public, static or not, we don't know yet. Uh, it's going to return an int. And it's going to be called abs. And it's going to take a single integer as a parameter. Okay, so we could, we could have a, a pretty good guess of what that method looks like in, inside the Java source code. It would be public, because if it wasn't public, we couldn't invoke it from outside the class. For now, we've only learned static, so we'll call it static. Um, 
it's going to return an int because we want to get the, in, the integer return value of the absolute value. It's going to be called abs and it's going to take a single integer. So that's probably what the, what the method's going to look like inside the math class if we looked at Java source code. Okay, so you can have a pretty good guess there of what methods look like just from how they're invoked. Okay. Um, so clients here, can you, can you explain parameters again? Is that, is that, is that sort of okay, client? We're going to go over this again and again and again as we go, so don't worry. Uh, if you're not fully getting it at this stage, we're going to do lots of examples, okay? Uh, well. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, we had another question there. Oh, we had another question about encapsulation. And encapsulation was all about hiding the complexity. And the example I used back in week, week one or week two was the car, okay? And if you know how to work um, the ignition lock and door locks, the steering wheel, pedals, three, two or three pedals, or maybe, uh, maybe even less with electric cars, but it's two or three pedals with petrol cars and uh, maybe a gear stick or a shifter for shifting automatics. Okay, so if you know how to work those things with a car, you can drive a car. You don't need to know about the mind boggling complexity that goes on with fuel injectors and ignition systems and fuel pumps and differentials and gearboxes. You don't know any of that mind numbing complexity, okay? So that's encapsulation in practice. You can, you can drive a car without knowing any of the complexity. All you need to know is put fuel in the car, check the oil once a month or whatever, put some, put, put some air in the tires once a month or whatever. And uh, then you just need to know about these four things to, to drive a car. Okay, so all, all the complexity is hidden from the user. Okay, and we can do the same thing with our own classes and we'll be, we'll be doing this by later in a term. But just jumping ahead a little bit to where we might go, we might have a product class. Okay. And then the product class is create. I'll just use general pseudo code for now. Create a product. I'll be save product. I'll be increase price of product. It'll be a load product. I might be saving products to file or database. We might be loading products from file or database. We might be creating products. We might be increasing the price of a product. And we might be doing a whole lot of other things as well. Okay. Um, so we don't need to know how any of these methods work. We don't need to know how they store their data. We don't need to know where they store their data. All we need to know is what the methods are called. For example, that there's a create product method and it takes a name and a price. Okay. That's all we need to know. And to save a product, we just call save. And to increase the price of a product, we say increase price. And we say the um, percentage that we want to increase by. So 10% would increase the price by 10%. And the load might be called load. Okay. So once we know what the method names are and the data types or whatever that need to be passed to the methods to do their job, save, save needs nothing. Create product needs a name and a price. Increase price just needs a percent. And load just needs a load or whatever. So imagine though there are methods that we had and uh, this is just a very, very small example. But uh, so we can use a product class without knowing any of the internal details. We don't need to know about how products are created. We don't need to know about where they're saved or how they're saved. We don't know about how increased price does its job. We don't know how to, need to know how the load method works. Okay, so just by knowing a few, a few simple commands and what data they need to do their job. So four simple commands, we can work with products. Okay, so the mind dummy complexity that might be contained in a product class, we don't have to know about. We don't have to know about it at all. So that's encapsulation. It's all about hiding the mind boggling <laughs> complexity of whatever we need to use. And whether that's cars or classes. We just need to know the interface. 
That's all we need to know to work with a, with a, with a car or a class. So for a car, it's the ignition and door locks, the steering wheel, the pedals and the gear stick. For the product class, it's the create product to save the increased price and the load. That's all we need to know and we can work with products. So pretty powerful stuff, encapsulation. It's a, it's a, it's a really huge area and we're just really scratching the surface. But um, one, of, one of the core topics in object-oriented programming is in, encapsulation. And it's not just Java, like I said, it's not just Java. Visual Basic, Pascal, Python, all those languages now do it. Um, JavaScript, if you write it rightly, if, you're, if, you're, if you do it right, <laughs> and uh, other languages as well. Okay, so that's encapsulation, hiding the mind-boggling complexity. So all you need to do is, is know what the interface is and how to use the interface, and you can go ahead and use the car or the class, or whatever you need to do. Uh, encapsulation method in a class. The calling method needs only to understand the interface to the method to call the method. So what the method name is and what parameters it needs to, to, to be in the call and what data needs to be passed in what order. Okay. So the interface is the only part of the method the client sees. And by, by client here, we mean us as programmers. If, if it's not our class, if we're just using someone else's classes or classes that have already been developed, we are the client of that class. We're the user of that class. Okay, so it's what the what 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 the client sees or what our classes see. Okay, more, more to the point. Not 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 just us, but our classes. Okay, so you can see from the example up here when we called the display address method in the first class, we just need to know what the class name was and the method name was was and whether it needed any parameters and what they might be. And we can just say class name dot method name to invoke that method because it was public. Okay. So encapsulation, one of the huge topics of OOP. Um, later on, we're going to be doing some GUI programming. Just to, just to give you another sort of view on this, later on, we're going to be do, doing some GUI programming. And we'll be writing code like this, sort of like this, not exactly, but sort of like this. Label. Heading equals new label my app version 1.0. That might be a heading we have in our application. Okay, so I've declared it like we declared dates, I've declared a label. So label, heading label equals new label, followed by a string. Okay. So I'm using the labels, the label class that's part of Java. And I don't need to know how Java does its labels. Okay, I don't need to know how they're drawn on the screen. I don't need to know um, how they're created or where the data is held. I don't need to know anything like that. I just need to know how to create a label and what methods I can use to work with labels. So if I want to change the heading to something else, I can say heading label dot set text. My app version 1.1 and I can change the heading by just, just by calling the set text method. So again, I don't need to know how the set text method works, I don't need to know how labels work. I just need to know that it's a class called label and that I can declare objects of type label and how to do it. And then I can go set text to, ch to change the text of the label. Okay, so that's something we're gonna be doing later in term towards uh, uh, week seven, week eight. Same with dates. Date today, new date. I don't need to know how Java stores dates. When we declared scanner, KB was new scanner, system.in. I didn't, I didn't need to know how scanner did its job. I didn't need to know how next line or next int or any of those, I didn't need to know how any of those methods worked. All I need to know is how to create a scanner object. And then that I need to call next line, next int or whatever to get the data back from, these, from the keyboard. I didn't need to know how Scanner worked with the default input device and how it linked up to the keyboard and how it knew it was a keyboard. I didn't need to know any of that. Okay, so it's all encapsulation. Everything we're doing is encapsulation. Hide the mind boggling complexity. <laughs> okay, anyway, I probably banged on about that long enough. Um, one, one of the key topics of OOP anyway, object-oriented programming. 
Define the following. Optional actually specifies return types, method names, parameter types, and the local name for a parameter. So, so creating a method that receives a single parameter, we're going to do the following. So let's look at our, we're going to say a raised salary. So we've got a, the access modifier. Um, we've got it static, everything's static for us at this stage. I can't really talk about that without going into a huge pyramid of complexity. So everything's just static for us. Void means it's not going to return any, any data. So there's no return down here anywhere. It's taking a single double and it's going to be, we, we're calling it salary. So salary is now a local piece of data for that predict raise method. So the scope of that method, the scope of that data or that, or that field called salary is from that opening curly bracket down to the closing one. Okay, so uh, uh, any, anywhere outside of the method, this particular variable called salary doesn't exist. Okay, so only for this, only for, it, for use inside the method. So we're declaring a new salary field. Final double equals, uh, final double raise rate equals 1.1a, so we're creating a little constant. Uh, new salary equals salary times the raise rate, so we're increasing our salary by 10%. And then we're printing out the new salary. System dot out the print line. Your current your current salary was that, and after the raise you're going to get that. Okay, so print out salary and new salary to the screen, so the user can see what the new salary is. Okay, so if we want to invoke that method from anywhere else in our in our code, anywhere that's got uh, we we can do it. For example, our main method, we might say double salary, $100, and then um, raise salary, salary. So I've happened to call them the same name. There's a salary here, and I'm passing this variable across the salary, but this one here is completely different. This, this salary here is local to the method. Okay, so they don't have to be the same name. I could call it Mike's salary. Passing Mike's salary. Okay, they're completely different variables. If they do happen to have the same name, if that happens to have the same name as that one, it doesn't matter. Java treats them as two completely separate variables. Okay, so I can, I can say raise salary by by one, uh, and pass in a value 100. So 100 gets passed in. Uh, the new salary is 100 times 1.1a. So now $110. And I see the current salary is 100. After the raise, it's $110. Okay. If you want to call it again, Pass in Wayne's salary, okay, and so the value one twenty forty five is going to get passed through as salary. So salary is going to have a value of one twenty forty five inside the method. The new salary is going to be one twenty forty five times one point one zero, and I'm, I can't work that out off the top of my head. So it's going to be something like one hundred thirty two dollars or something like that. One hundred thirty two dollars, yeah, something, something around there. Okay, so. We can, we can just call it, we can just keep calling raise salary as much as we like. Okay. If we, if we called it like this, what do you think would happen? Would that be, would, would this be legal? Would that be okay? I, I, it doesn't need static. We, 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 we can just call raise salary. That's okay. The, 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 the static the static doesn't come into we we haven't talked about what static means and we can't without going down to into, into a deep iceberg of topics <laughs> so that's going to be for the future but for, if it doesn't need static then that's fine but what does it need does it need anything inside here let's have a look at the method and it takes a double of type uh, a, a, a double called salary or double a piece of double data floating point data okay so you can't you can't have round brackets with nothing in them so that would be an error and Java would say 
I cannot find a Ray Celery method that takes no parameters, basically. It will give you an error message at MedDad. Okay. What about this? Ray Celery, $5.50. Would that be okay? Yep. Wayne says, yep, and I agree. All okay. As long as, we, as long as we're passing in a bit of data of type double, uh, predict race can do its job. Uh, yes, is, and, and Sanjin says yes, is a double, it is double format. So as long as it's double variable, that's fine. Well, what about this one? This is getting a bit trickier. And is that okay, passing in an integer? So remember we spoke about what happens when you Yes, exactly right, Wayne. So Wayne said it's promoted to be F-top double, and that's exactly right. Yep, so Java automatically promotes. Okay, so it does all the automatic promotion for you. So that's fine. That, that's all okay. So it's yes. What about this? Is that one okay? Yep. So Sanjin says it's an error, and I agree, Sanjin. It is an error because we're trying to pass in a string, but the, but the method only takes a, du a double. So we're trying to pass a string as a double, which isn't okay. It's the same as saying this. Java's not going to like that. That's going to be an error. <laughs> and that's exactly what it's doing here. So that's an error. Jared's asking, could you use passing? And, and you could be, you'd be exactly right. Okay, so we'll come on to that shortly. We'll come on to that. So let's do another one. Uh, let's say if you pass in the value one, two, three, would, would that be okay? We'll do one more, then we'll do the passing, Jared. That's, that's a good, very good question. Do you think this one is okay? Yep, so again, it's a string. To pass in the string one two three. That's not a number. That's a string. We're trying to pass that in as a double, which nope, not going not to be allowed. So that's where the pass in and pass double comes in. Okay, so that one is perfect. As, as long as this is an integer, Java's happy to convert it to an integer, and then Java's happy to promote it to be a double in the in the method call. That's quite okay. And if we wanted to use a double, it'll be double dot pass double. Then we could still use a value one two three. That would be okay. You can convert one two three to a double. That's fine. Or if you want to have decimal places as well, dot forty five. That's still okay. So as long as whatever is passed the method is a number that can be converted to a double or is a double, then Java's going to be happy. Okay, so it'll try really hard to find the right method for you. So local variable, it's known only within the bounds of the method. So salary here, this, this, this variable called salary, has got scope of method. So it's got method scope. It exists only during the predict raise method call. So from that curly bracket to that curly bracket. After that, this, this variable called salary no longer exists. Okay. And like I said, if I, if, I, if I create another variable outside of the method called salary, they happen to have the same name, okay, but they are completely different fields in memory. So this is completely different variable to salary in method. I'll put that down on the next line so you can read it all, sorry. Okay, 
completely different variable. You, you, you might as well have called it ABC. That, that's different. Java, there are two variables called Valerie, but they're completely different. Java keeps track of which one's which. There's one here that's local inside the method. Okay, there's this one, and there's this one which is local inside whatever the method this one is. This is here or over here. Okay, so this is the calling method, and this is the called method. And, and this, this double salary is local to the called method. This one here is local to the calling method, whatever that might be. That might be our main method. Is that okay? Is everyone all right with that? Okay, any questions? Wayne's giving thumbs up, thanks Wayne. Okay. So it's not only within the bounds of the method or we can say it's got method scope. It exists only within the bounds of that method. Each time the method executes, the variable is redeclared and recreated. Okay, so if Celery had a value on a previous call, it's gone and completely forgotten in the next call. Okay, a new memory location, large enough to hold the type, is set up and named, and uh, and and the value is passed into that new mem memory location. Okay, so every time we call the, every time we call this method, whatever variables are declared here in the method header and here, so all of those are automatically recreated every time. So anything that says recreate it from scratch. Uh, so we're here we're going to call predict raise three times. We're going to um, demonstrating some raises. We're going to raise with a value that we can hard code. So that's called hard coding the data. We're, 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 the only time we can change that data is at compile time. We're going to change our source code and recompile it. So that's called hard coding. Then we're using a salary variable, which is a double, 200. And then we're using starting wage, which is a value of 800. So we're just calling the method three times. So first time through, we'll get a, a 400 as a salary, and after the raise, it'll be 440. The next time through, it'll be 200 and 200, 210, 220. And the next time through, it'll be 800 and 880. Okay. And this variable here is recreated each time. Any prior values that had are completely lost. Same with these ones. These are recreated each time as well. Any prior values that had are gone. Okay, so Java doesn't remember the past. Just remembers the current values. A method can require more than one parameter. Um, you can list the arguments within call to the method separate with call commas. So just separate the values or arguments by commas. And a call, you can call a method by supplying those arguments and I must match the number of parameters. So if a method takes five parameters, you must pass five parameters. And if it's string int double, it's gonna be string int double or something that can be promoted to those. So I've got to match on type and the number of parameters and the type of parameter in the right order. So here we've got predict predict raise using rate. So instead of hard coding the rate now, which used to be hard coded here as 1.1, we're now allowed to pass in the rate. So we're gonna predict the raise using the, sal using the rate and we're passing in a salary and a, and a rate, okay? And the salary is used here and the rate is used here. So here I, here I can call, oops, so no examples. I don't want to do some examples on the predictor raise using rate. I could call it with an integer and a rate of five. So how much is that going to raise salary? <laughs> let's, let's do the easy one first. 100.10.10. Okay, so in here we're going to pass through value 0 0.10 as the rate. So our salary is going to be multiplied by 1 plus 0 0.10, which is 1.10. So our new salary is going to increase by 10%. What if I pass through the value 5? What's the salary going to increase by? If I pass through the value 100, what will the new salary be?
it'll be six times your age, won't it? So you'll go from $100 to $600. Okay, so you'll, be, you'll be careful what value you should pass in as a rate rise, or as a rate. <laughs> yep, 600%, well done, mine, yep. So, yep, mine's got it, 600%. Um, okay, and so we can pass in ints or doubles. Ints or doubles, that's fine. Uh, but not strings, not dates. Uh, and nothing else, just strings or doubles or, or ints. Okay. Sorry, just doubles or ints, not strings. Here we've got a, a, compute, a compute commission method that takes in an integer value, a double rate, and a char for vehicle. So maybe this is a sales class for selling vehicles. And um, S might be sedan or sports car or something. I don't know what they mean, but. The value is 23,000 and the commission rate's 8%. So I'm gonna pass in 23,000 for the value, value is 23,000. That comes in here as the value. So that's int. Okay. And then I've got the com rate is 0.08. So com rate comes in here as the rate. That's the next parameter. Okay, so rate. And then V type is the V type, which is S. So that's a char. And that comes in as a char. Okay, so, those, so for now on during this method call, these are the values we're using, value, rate, and vehicle. They're the, they're the values that have been passed in. So that they're the values we can use for calculations and things. So commission equals value times rate. So for the first method call, it would be 23,000 times 0.08. And uh, whatever the vehicle char is, so it's an S in this, in this first case. I'm just talking about this first method call. So the S type vehicle is worth 23,000 with rate times 100. So we're converting the, the commission to a percentage by multiplying it by 100. So value times rate, so it's 8% of 23,000. <clears> so 2100, somewhere around there probably. So we probably see with uh, with 8% commission, the commission is, and it would be something like 20, 20, 2100 or somewhere around there. I don't know it exactly. Okay. But it's 8% of 23,000, whatever that is. Okay. Then for the next method call, we're passing the values 40,000, 0.10, 0.10, and L. So 40,000 would be the value, 0.10 would be the rate, and L would be the vehicle. So the commission would be. 40,000 times 0.10, so $4,000 commission. And we'd see on screen the L vehicle, the L type vehicle is worth 40,000. And with, so rate times 100, so it'd be 0.10 times 100. So with 10% commission rate, the commission is the commission, which we just calculated to be $4,000. Okay, so maybe L stands for luxury, maybe S stands for standard, we don't know. Maybe S stands for sports car, L stands for limousine, we don't know. <laughs> okay. Okay, so just if, if it takes an int, a double and a char, you've got to pass the data in in that order. Three bits of data in that order and, uh, and Java can call the method. Okay, so there's it, there's it running there. 1840, we had a pretty good guess of that, and 4,000. Uh, okay, so the return statement allows methods to return values. So if, if you pass data into a method and it does some work and it passes back results, you can pass those results back with a single return statement. You can have one return statement in a method. Well, <laughs> yeah, you, can only, you can only return one value at a time. So return, returning, return data, results, whatever from a method. So after, you, after you've done a method call, you can return data via return statement. So the return statement causes a value to be sent from the call method 
back to the calling method. So you're exiting the method and returning with the value. And it also calls you to exit the method. Return type, return type can be any type used by Java. Primitive types, class types, void means return nothing. And we can also pass back arrays, which we haven't done yet. We can pass back um, all sorts of things. We, we're not going to do it to the follow on course. So you can pass back stacks and queues and trees and all sorts of things you can pass back. So, so you can pass back ints, doubles, so an int or a double, string, a date, you can pass back class objects, and arrays and all sorts of things. So um, it's just one item you can return, but that item could be an array of other objects. So I'll come to that later in a turn. So whatever the method's type is in the, in the method header, so when you say a type like void, void means we have no return statements. Uh, if you say int, you've got to return an integer. If you say string, you've got to return a string. If you say double, you've got to return a double and so on. So the, so the, so the, the method type and the return type data must be the same. And if you don't get them right, Java will give you a mismatch error saying you can't return this type of data for this type of method. So here's an example of returning some data. So we're taking in a salary, a single parameter of salary, a double, and we've got a new amount there and a raise, a hard-coded raise amount again, a new amount equals salary times raise, and then we're passing back the return amount, whatever the new amount is, we're returning it. So the returns that we've declared new amount to be double, and that's what we're returning, we're returning a double, so our method type is gonna be of type double. So if we want to call that method now, we could say int or double. My new salary equals predict raise. And I'm on $100 a week. Okay. So the value 100 would be passed across here for salary. And the calculation here would be new amount equals 100 times 1.10, which is $110 and 110 would be returned here. So my salary would have a value of 110. So if I printed, if I system.out.println my salary to the screen, I would see the value 110.00. So we're calling a method, we're passing in some data, and we're getting a result back or a value back again via the return statement. Okay, so that return says, Exit the method and return this value. Now, just because the method returns something doesn't mean you have to do it. Doesn't, doesn't mean you have to make use of it. Okay, so this, this code here is perfectly fine. We're, we're calling a method and we're passing in some data and it's returning 110, but we're not storing it anywhere. We're not using it. We're not, we're not getting it back. We just, we're just calling the method to, um, to call a method. I don't know why we're calling it, but we're calling it. And uh, but just because it returns a value doesn't mean you have to use it or get it. So this code here is all okay. But the return value is thrown away. It's just discarded. Unreachable statements. So logical flow leaves a method at the return statement. So return statement means return and exit. And can never exit, it can never execute and it causes a compile error. So unreachable statements, let's have a look at those. So the method we just looked at, we had some calculations and then a return statement. That was the method we just looked at. If I had code down here as well, if I had any code down there, even if it was just setting variables to zero or whatever, these would all be unreachable. 
unreachable statements. Cannot be reached because as soon as that return is encountered, that, that value is whatever it is is returned and the method is exited. Okay, so the, 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 the method exits and my, my new salary gets the value and the code executes from that point onwards. Okay, so if you've got any code after the return statement, it's unreachable. Okay, so if you get an unreachable statements error, just check your return statement, check it's not too far up in the method, or make sure this code, make sure that this code should be wherever it should be, and uh, you'll, be, you'll be good to go. Any method that might call any number of methods, so any method might call any number of methods. So a method can call method one, method two, method three, method four, method five, as many as it likes. And each of those methods can call other methods, and each of those methods can call other methods, and each of those methods can call other methods. There's really no limit to what you can do. Okay. Uh, every method, ex so this is coming back to encapsulation. Encapsulation and black boxing are very similar, or they're the same. Black box. So a black box, uh, if we had a box here that we could put in values and crank the handle and get values back out again, that's really what encapsulation means, black box. Okay. Um, so we don't need to know how it works. We just need to know how to call it and how to get the result back. Or what, to, what, what sort of result it is coming back. Is it a double? Is it a string coming back? Or an integer or something? Okay, so we need to know what the method name is. We need to know what parameters it, are, parameters it takes or values it takes in what order. And then what, what the result is. Is it a double or a string or what's coming back? So here we've got the um, uh, predict arrays. And here we're also creating a bonus amount. So we're creating their raise or calculating their raise. And then we're calculating their bonus amount. And that depends on their salary. So the bonus depends on the salary for this company, which is pretty cool, I guess, if you're high paid. If you're not high paid, it's not that cool, I guess. Um, and then the new amount is new amount plus the bonus amount. So we're just adding an extra method call in there just to show you how it works. So a method can call as many methods as it likes, and you can do that until you run out of memory. Just call and call and call and call, and each one can call and call and call as much as you like. Every object, Ooh, okay. So we're now moving on to classes and objects. That's, it. That's the end of our methods for now, but we'll be doing methods a lot throughout the rest of the term, okay? So everything we do for now is gonna be methods. <laughs> Objects. Moving on to the next topic now, which is objects and classes. And this is really, really core for programming uh, in the 21st century. What we're learning is, in fact, what we've learned so far is not just Java, it applies to all languages, everything we've learned so far. Okay, so every object is a member of a class. So when I say date today equals new date, date. So today is an object of type date. Today, object of type date. If you want to say it another way, today is an example of, of a date or type date of a date. So you can say it all different ways. Or if you want to say it another way, uh, today is an instance of date. So all of those things all mean the same thing. So when I say today is an object of type date, it just means it's a bit of a bit of data or, or a variable of type date. Variable or field, whatever you want, whatever terminology you're happy with, I'll, I'll use variable here. Variable of type date. So all of these things all mean the same thing. So so if I, if I start talking about objects or instances, don't 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 worry. All all I mean when I say instances something is a, an example of a particular type of data or an object based on that type of data or a variable based on that type of data. That's what I'm saying when I say the word instance or object. Okay, so don't let those scare you. They all mean the same thing. They want to say, today's an instance of a date. I'm, I'm just saying really, today's a variable of type date. When I, when I say string, name equals 
might, then name is an, a variable of type string, um, name is an object of type string, name is an example of a string, and name is an instance of string. Okay, so I can say those same things again, but change, change all those to names, and all those to strings. Okay, so that's all I'm saying. Okay, so um, there's a is a relationship there. Is a there's a bunch of different relationships we're going to talk about through this course and a follow-on course, and one of them is the is a relationship. Okay, and today is a date, and name is a string. You might be thinking. Well, that's pretty obvious. <laughs> What's the point? Okay, we're coming on to we're coming on to deeper topics as we go. Okay, so um, uh, if I said if I said true or false, uh, today is a string. What would you say? And if I said true or false, name is a date. What would you say? Anyone have a have a guess? I'm watching the chat window. Yeah, that's why, Ryan. They're, they're both false. That's false. Okay. Okay. So, so this is a relationship. Is all about working out what type of data something is. Think of it that way. Today is an instance of date. Today is an example of a date. Today is an ex a variable of type date. Today is an object of type date. Okay, so today is nothing to do with strings. And similarly for name, names are strings, so names nothing to do with dates. It might seem pretty obvious, but we're just talking about, we're, we're getting into stuff where we're going to be talking about relationships between data now. So we're just starting to sort of peel back. There's a big onion coming up, there's a huge onion, and we're going to be peeling off the layers for the next two courses and having to look deeper and deeper. Okay. Uh, if, you, if you declare shark to be of type fish, then sharks an instantiation of a fish class or an example of a fish or a type of fish and so on. So the whole idea of talking about objects is all about reusability. So it's all about reusability and not having to reinvent the wheel all the time. And we'll talk about that more as we go. And uh, that's, a, that's a huge topic as well. So we just sort of terminology at the moment. Methods are often called upon to return a piece of information to the source of the request. In other words, to the caller. And the class client or the class user is an application or class that instantiate objects of another pre-written class. And we've been doing that the whole whole term already. We've been, uh, we've been we're, well, since week two anyway, we've been doing scanner and we've been doing date. And we'll be doing other things, the J option pane class. Although we didn't instantiate anything there. So I might, be, might mention that one. But um, certain for scanners and dates, we've been creating objects of those types of week two. Okay, so we didn't write those classes, they're part of Java. Okay, but we can just do the same with our own class as well. So we can create a class public class employee. And then we can, we can so later on in other, in other in other classes, we can say employee Mike equals new employee. Okay, so that's where we're heading. We're heading to creating our own data types, for example, employee or customer or whatever. And we can then declare employees or customers or whatever in our own, in other classes and then call methods. So there might be methods inside here and we can call those methods some Mike, with the dot notation that we looked at earlier. So Mike dot and we can call methods. Okay, and if we have another. If we declare another employee called Fred or Bella, you could say Bella dot and call those methods. So that's where we're heading. Okay. And, uh, and we'll, we'll do, we'll, we'll, head, we'll head in that direction for the, for, the, for the rest of this course and for the follow on course. Okay, so we're looking at creating objects of a, of a type of, of another class. And we'll be doing that since week two. So don't let it scare you. 
Ah, right. So, so Wayne said only if the method name is public, and that's exactly right. So, if method name is in this class here and it's public, public, sorry, method name, void, method name. Have to look like that. Yes, that's that's quite right. It's got to be public. If it was private, we, we couldn't use it outside of the class. That would be an error. Okay, so we assign a name to a class. We determine what type of data and methods we part of the class. We create a class header with three parts: an optional access modifier, the keyword class, and any legal identifier for the name of the class. So any valid class name is okay. And we have a public class and accessible by all objects that we all objects that we might create or um, and, and available for use in other classes as well. So we're getting onto this whole idea of reusability. For example, there's a public class employee num. It's got a it's got a single it's got a single field or, or variable called integer. It's a type integer called emp num. Okay, and it's private. So every every employee we create, like Mike and Bella, they will have their own area of memory where their data is stored. And at this stage, it's just the employee number. So there'll be an integer called employee number and Mike will have his own employee number and Bella will have her own employee number. Okay. Just like if we create two dates or two scanner objects, they're objects in memory and each scanner object's got their own uh, memory location and own data and each date has got their own memory location and own data. Okay, so same with our own classes that we're creating. Okay, so we create an object of type of a type employee called Mike, another one called Bella, and there are two, two classes are stored in memory for employees, and one for Mike and one for Bella, both completely separate. Uh, extended to be used as a basis for any other class. The classes can be extended, and we'll talk about that more in the follow-on course. You can have data fields or, or variables declared within the class, but outside of any method. So up here we could have class data, for example, private int emp num. We could have other ones as well, like private string string imp name, and so on. We could have a whole lot of data here. So every every employee we declare have their own number and name and email address and phone number and whatever else you want to keep track of. Okay, so every employee you create gets its own copy of all that data. It's unique for that, for that, for that employee. Uh, Non-static, so the, these are all instance variables or class data. Instance. Class data. Okay, they're non-static. I don't have the keyword static in there. I can't talk about static at this stage. It's, it's a huge pyramid I need to talk about. Okay. Private access to fields. So keep your data private unless there's very, very good reason for it to be public. Okay. And um, we'll talk about that more next week or in week six. Only methods of the same class are allowed to use private variables. So only methods we declare here inside the class, public or private methods, doesn't matter. Any methods we declare inside the class can use this data. Okay. Anything outside the class cannot use that data. So if I say mike.impnum, that would be an error. Okay. Because that data is private. If I try and print it to the screen or change its value or initialize it outside of the class, I'll get an error because that data is private. And that means these class methods can have validation rules and ensure the data is valid. So nothing outside the, outside the class can corrupt the data or change the data. That's what it's all about. Uh, for the first few classes we create, we're not going to have any validation at all, but later on we're going to be having validation in our methods so that um, we're, we're validating these fields for each employee, for example. Most of the methods we create at this stage will be public. Uh, later on, we'll be creating methods that should only be private. They, sh they should only be used by other methods in the class, so little helper methods. Uh, but for now, everything we create as a method will be public. Keep, you, keep your data private though. The class methods can contain, okay, we've got some terminology coming up, don't be scared. <laughs> we've got mutator methods. And mutator methods are methods that change or set or change class values. 
We've got accessor methods, and they're methods that we can, can only retrieve class data or class values. And we've got non-static methods or instance methods, and they belong to objects, and that's a huge area we can't really talk about just yet. So mutator methods change class data. They're called setters or mutators, and accessor methods are, or getter methods, are retrieve class values or retrieve data. So you've got accessors or getter methods, and they retrieve class data, and then you've got mutator. They're also called setters, setter methods, and they change class data. So mutator just means change. Uh, we won't talk about static just yet. It's a huge area. Uh, there's a big discussion on static. We might talk about it next week. We're running out of time. We'll, we'll press on. We'll do some, we'll do some more talk about static in, in week six. So there's an example of creating a class object. So my class is the class we've created. Object is just the name we're giving our class object equals new my class. Okay. Uh, object dot public non static method, object dot public non static method. Okay, so there we're invoking instance methods. That's these sorts of methods here. So method method name is a is a method two name. So these are instance methods that don't have static here. But later on, we'll also be creating maybe static methods as well inside our classes. Okay. And they can be called two ways, but the, the most common way to call them is with a class name. So class name dot pub stat method. So that would be for us here, it would be uh, employee is that. Um, so it would be employee dot method three name. I'm in a class, I'll call you back. Hang on. <clears throat> okay, method three name, and then pass in the data that's needed for the method. Okay, so that would be a class name dot, dot method name call, because that's a static method. We'll talk about more static more in, in week six, okay. Um, if you had private methods inside your class, if that was a private method, you're trying to call it from outside your class, that would be an error. Okay, and same if you try to call private non-static methods or private instance methods from outside your class, that would be an error as well. So the only thing you can do from outside your class is call public methods. And if they're static methods, you, you call them with the class name dot. And if they're instance methods, they don't have a static in the title anywhere, then you call them with the object that you've declared. So Michael Bella dot method name. Okay, public static's a huge area. We'll get onto that. Uh, in, uh, in week six. Okay, so this is an example of a, a very simple little uh, employee class. It's only got one field or one, or one bit of class data, private int employee num. And the way the outside class interacts with that field is via the get num method and the set num method, set employee num method. Get employee num, set employee num. So what sort of method is this one? Is that a, is that a mutator or an accessor method? The set num method is that is that a mutator or or an accessor? No, it's no balls. It's actually changing. Yes, Wayne, that's right. Wayne and Jared got it. So it's actually changing class data. We're changing and we're, we're passing an, an, an integer in here, and it's changing our class field. Emp num equals equals a new value. So we're changing class data. So that's that's a mutator or a setter method. So mutator or setter. It's one of those ones. What about get employee num? What is that? Is that an accessor or a mutator? Accessor. J Jared's got it right. So it's, it is an accessor method. So it's just returning the employee num. So it's returning some private class data back to the calling method. Okay. And um, so that's an accessor or a getter method. Okay. So for, for, each, for each field we create in our class, we might have an employee name and a employee address and all sorts of things. We'll have a accessor and a mutator for each one. Okay. And like I said earlier, if there was rules around employee ID, for example, it had to be greater than zero and it had to be greater than less than 100 or something like that, 
we would have all the statements in here to make sure that employee ID couldn't be set to something that wasn't valid. So we'll be doing a whole lot of validation in our mutator methods or setter methods. Okay. Uh, accessor methods, on the other hand, tend to be very simple. They just tend to be return this, return that, whatever the data is. If they're returning an integer, like in this case, employee num's an integer, so they're of type int. If they're returning a string, like employee name, that would be string there. Okay. And the, the mutator methods generally are void methods, what we do at this stage. But if you wanted to see whether the setting was valid or not, you might return a Boolean. So you might validate this data if it's greater than zero and if it's less than 100, change the employee num, else you might want to return false, indicating that the, the method wasn't successful. Okay, in that case, it might be a Boolean method to return true or false. Or if you wanted to return an error code, zero is okay, one's an error, two's means this, three means that, you could return an int. Okay, so generally the, the accessor methods are very simple, just return, return whatever. Okay, and the mutator methods, for what we're doing so far are very simple, but if this is a real program being developed for industry, there would be a lot of validation going on in, in here for every field before, before we allow the, the program to change the, whatever data was passed in, before we allow the class data to be changed, we would do a whole lot of validation on that. If it's not less than zero, and if it's greater than this, and if it's less than that, and, and all sorts of things. Okay, so we're keeping our class data pure, not, not letting it be polluted. <laughs> okay, so you place the data fields in logical order at the beginning of the class and list the fields vertically. So put your class data at the top and then your methods down below. Data fields and methods may be placed in any order. Like I said earlier, you can put them in any order. You can have data, then methods, then more data, then methods, and more data, then methods. But that just makes your class chaotic. Put all your data at the top and then your methods after, after that. So something like this is great. So here we've got an employee num, a last name, a first name, and a salary, an int, a string, a string and a double. So we've got four class fields, or four class instance fields. So we've got a getter or an accessor method for employee num and then a mutator and then an accessor or a, or a getter for last name, just returns the last name and then a, a mutator or a setter for last name and then a getter or, a, or an accessor for first name, just returns the first name and then a mutator or a setter for the first name, which changes the first name. And then a getter or, or, or an accessor for, mute, for salary, and then a mutator or a setter for salary, changing the salary. So the mutators change class data, the getters just return it, the accessors just return it. Okay, so get, get first name just returns the first name, get salary just returns the salary, set first name changes the first name, and set salary changes the salary. So these are all the class fields we're talking about here, the emp salary and emp first name that we declared up above. That's all these fields, the class fields. So with this class now, I could declare employees called Mike. Mike equals new employee, and I could say set emp num to 55. That's my employee num. And I could, and I could say, set first name. Just make sure I've got the call right. Uh, set employee first name. Emp first name to Mike. And I could then call the getter method system dot out dot print line. Say Mike dot get first get get employee first name plus imp ID is Mike dot get employee num. Okay, so I'm calling the first name method get, get, get employee first name for Mike and then get employee second name or get employee number for Mike. Okay. And I've called set employee number for Mike and I've called set employee first name for Mike. Okay, so, so it's all about setting class data and then getting it back again when you need it. Okay, so if there's any validation to be done, these set methods will be doing it. 
and these get methods just return the class data. So we've made our class, remember we talked about encapsulation? This is all encapsulation in progress. To use this employee class now, all I need to know is the name of the class and what methods are available and what parameters they take. Okay, and then I can work with employees. I don't need to know how these methods work. I don't need to know what validation they're doing. I don't need to know where they're storing their data. I don't need to know where they're saving or loading data from. All I need to know is what, what the class is called and what the public methods are that are available to me and what parameters they take, if any. Okay, so it's all encapsulation in, in progress. <laughs> so there's an example of creating an employee. You can do it on two lines, employee, some employee. So that's declaring the employee called some employee and then initializing the employee, some employee equals new employee. Or you can do it all on one line, which is the most common way to see it. So that's declaring the employee and initializing them all at the same time, all on the one line of code. So like we did with scanner, we said scanner keyboard equals new scanner. We're just doing the same thing for employees. Employee, some employee equals new employee. It's just the same terminology. In fact, with string, you can do it as well. The string name is equal to Mike. That's a little shortcut that Java has allowed, but, but really behind the scenes, the code looks like this. Equals new string. So both of those do the same thing. Java allows us this nice little shortcut which is quite nice because strings are so common. Okay, so employee Michael gives new employee. We're really doing the same thing for string here. So reference to the object is the name of the memory address. The, is the name for a memory address where the object is held. So Mike is a location in memory where all that employee data is held for Mike. If I create another employee called Bella, there's another location in memory where all the data is held for Bella. Okay. So, got a question each from Troy. Um, is, there a, is there a limit to how many methods you can have in a class? And there's not. You, you're really only limited by the amount of memory your, your machine's got. So, you, you could have a class with a million methods if you wanted to. Okay. I've never known anyone to do that. That would be insane. Uh, you would probably want to break that class and down into other classes because uh, trying to reduce complexity. But you, you could. Okay. After using after an object is instantiated, its methods can be accessed via the object identifier, the dot, and the method call. So, the object identifier, Mike, with a dot, followed by the method name. Object identifier, Mike, dot, method name. And even with the, with the accesses, it's object name, dot, method name. So I said, like they called it a dot notation. Object name, dot. So here I've got two employees, clerk and a driver. Clerk dot set employee number three four five. So that's that's created a clerk that's got its own employee da employee uh, data in memory in a certain location, and driver's got its own copy of the of the employee data, its own personal copy at another memory location. So when I say clerk set employee number three four five, that doesn't affect driver at all. Driver's got their own data, okay. And when I say driver dot set employee number five six seven, that sets the driver's data has no effect on clerk. So the clerk's number is clerk.getEmployeeNum and the driver's number is driver.getEmployeeNum. So it's object.method. That's all it comes down to. So we don't need to know how the employee class stores its data or works, how, how things work inside. We just need to know what the methods are and, and how to invoke them. So this is all data hiding or encapsulation in, in progress. And we keep all that data private unless there's very good reason to, for it to be public, to keep your data private. And um, for, for now, most of our methods will be public. In fact, probably all our methods will be public for now. Later on, we'll, get, we'll create methods that shouldn't be called outside of the class and they'll be declared private. So the client application, in other words, the, the main program, for example, accesses the, the employee class methods via the public interfaces, which is the public methods. So get employee num, get employee first name, 
set employee num, set employee first name. That's the public interface to the class, what all the, what all the public methods are. The set method controls a value set to the, used to set a variable of the class or a class variable. So these are the, the setters or the mutator methods. And the get methods control how the data is retrieved or what's retrieved. And they're the accessor or the getter methods. Same, term, same terminology we've already used. So. Employee chauffeur equals new employee is actually calling a method called employee round brackets. There's actually a method there that's being called behind the scenes, which we haven't created. And that's called a default constructor. And if you don't provide one in your classes, Java automatically provides one for you. Okay. And, uh, and it initializes class data for you. Okay. So when I say Mike employee equals new Mike, we didn't actually create a constructor in our class. There's no method called employee round brackets. That doesn't exist inside our class. So Java's created one for us when we compiled our code and it's inserted it into our class for us automatically. And it's initializing our class data for us automatically whenever an object is created. Okay. So when I, when I say employee Mike equals new employee, uh, the employee ID is set to zero and the salary is set to 0, 0.0. And the last name and the first name are both set to null. They both refer to the null memory address. Okay, so it initializes your data automatically if you don't provide a constructor, but does it initialize it for values that you want? And maybe null and null aren't what you want. So that's why you look at creating your own constructors. So constructors are just code that's automatically run. That's code that's automatically run. And you create a class. They've got the same name as a class. And they are public. They've got no return types. Some rules there for constructor. Um, so you've got the same name as a class, they've got to be public and they've got no return types. In this case here, we've, we haven't provided a, we, we never provided an employee constructor. So it's automatically, Java automatically creates one for us and calls it. Okay. Initializes numbers to zero, booleans to false, chars the, to the zero character, and strings and reference types to null. That's how they're initialized. And that's it. So numbers to zero, booleans to false, characters to the zero character, and reference types that's also to null. That's how the default constructor works if you don't provide one. Okay, the one that Java automatically creates for your classes does that initialization. A constructor must have the same name as a class, cannot have a return type and public, as I just said here, same things. For example, if you want to if you want to set all employees to have a salary of three hundred dollars, you can do that in your constructor. Public employee, so it's got no return type. It cannot have a return type. It's got the same name as a class, and it must be public. Okay, so that's the rules for a constructor. And here I'm here I'm setting it so when I create an employee, say employee Mike equals new employee, the default salary is three hundred dollars. Unless I unless I call set salary or a set salary method, the default salary will be three hundred dollars. And you could set um, the default name to be blank and the default, the default uh, employee ID to be zero or whatever you want um, as well. So classes you create become data types and they're often re referred to as abstract data types or ADTs. So abstract data types is just a fancy name for the employee class. It's data types we're creating, abstract data types. They don't exist naturally, we're creating them to serve our own needs for our own applications that we're developing. The implementation, in other words, what's inside the methods and what's inside the class is hidden because we're using encapsulation and it's accessed, the class is accessed or the, the, the insides of the class are accessed only via the public methods. They're also called programmer defined data types or user defined data types, abstract data types, programmer defined data types, uh, user defined data types, all mean the same thing. Okay, they're just classes we create or objects we create or classes we create. They're not built into the language, not, so that the employee class isn't built into Java. We've created our own data type called employee. So it's an abstract data type. It's also called a programmer defined data type. 
but it's also called a user defined or user created data type. Um, you can declare an object from one of your classes, provide the type and the identifier. Just like we've done, we've done, we've created objects of our own classes. There we go. Employee Mike equals new employee. We've created our own object of our own abstract data type. Okay, so that's it for this week. If what we've, anything we've done today, we've done a lot in today's lecture. We've done methods, although we've done them in the tube, but that didn't really count. We've done methods and we've done objects. We've done accessors and mutators. And we've talked about public and private more. They're the main topics for this week. If any of that's confused you, please don't worry. We're going to be doing all of this really, really thoroughly in, in the shoots. And if you, if you need more practice, there's the textbook questions. And don't forget there's the videos on YouTube there. They're all linked in the class website where there's worked examples of all the questions and many others that you can do. Okay. Is there a tutorial for this week? Yes, there is. Uh, yep, we'll do a tutorial this week. Oh, so uh, this week's Easter Friday, isn't it? So I, th I think we're still doing a shoot this Friday. I'm, I'm happy to do one. Um, uh, if, if for some reason there's not a shoot, if, if the uni tell me, email me and say you can't do a shoot on Friday, the classes are cancelled, what I'll do is I'll record videos and upload them to the course webpage or upload, I'll, I'll email you out what the questions are, uh, what, the, what the videos are, um, or we'll make other arrangements. We'll do a class on a Thursday. Something. So another question there, when can we have a recording of this lecture? And it, it takes about three or four days for the video. It takes about three or four days for the video to be made available to me. And then I spend about three or four hours doing editing on it. I do little pop-ups and I trim the ending because usually there's a long beginning part that's people joining and everything like that. I, I cut that off and I cut the end off and I, I, I um, pop up. If, if anything needs further explanation, I pop up little dialogues to say, you know, this is what I mean there or correction. I said the wrong thing, thing there, I really meant that. So, um, that, that, so it takes about three or four days for me to get the video. Then it takes me usually about three to four hours of editing. And then I upload it to YouTube. So they're available on YouTube. So, um, so this video should be available. Yeah, so it's not gonna be available this week. It's probably gonna be Tuesday next week or Wednesday next week, I'd say. Um, with that said though, so the video not for this class, so, so the videos Bruce has done in prior terms, they're all available from the course webpage as well, but just not this class one yet. Okay, but I'll, I'll try and get that as quick as I can. And as soon as I get it, as soon as I get the video, I'll, I'll edit it and upload it as quick as I can. Okay, so I, I do it the same day. The same day I get it, I, I edit it, I spend hours and hours editing it and watching it through. And I put a table of contents in on the videos. So you can go to YouTube and click on the table of contents and jump straight to that location. And so putting all that thing on takes about three or four hours. It's, it's quite a big, big, big amount of work. It, it, it takes more time to edit the video than it does to run the class. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. Okay, I think that's it for this week. Thanks for coming along. Stay safe. Get lots of programming crash practice in. Get lots, lots of programming. Uh, explore all the topics. Write lots of code. Do lots of textbook questions. Do lots of tutorial questions. And, uh, and we'll also have the... Unless, unless you hear otherwise on email, uh, we'll have to shoot later this week as well. Okay. Thanks for watching. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for joining in, everyone. And uh, take care and see you next week. We'll see you in the tube. Thanks, Mark.